everybody. Welcome to the Starting a Counseling Practice podcast, where we connect you with clinicians from all over the country and all over the world who share their journeys of moving into successful private practice and creating a good, happy, balanced life. Uh, Sometimes we share stories where it's a very straight shot and sometimes it's wiggle jiggle along the way. Um, But we hope that today really um, inspires you. I'm excited to introduce you to Tracy, who's been kind enough to make sure that I do not butcher her last name. I did it once. Okay. Um, (laughs) But she's going to introduce herself. Tracy, will you introduce yourself, um, your and your practice and where you're located? Sure. Thank you so much, Miranda. Yeah, I so I'm Tracy Penunuri. Um, I always say it's a terrible last name, but a good husband. So it all worked (laughs) out, um, but it did take me a lot of years to learn to say it. Um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and have a private practice, a group private practice um, based in the suburbs of Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, And we transitioned from individual private practice to group about three and a half years ago. So we have... um, a staff, we're just, but we just popped through 20. So I think we're at 21 um, clinicians, including a couple of nurse practitioners and in our admin team. So um, we're super lucky to work with amazing, amazing people in our area, but mm. our team is just, is incredible. So it's, it's, ah. it's a super privilege to be a part of Mountain View Family Therapy for sure. Fantastic. Okay. So I always like to start with this question. In like a minute or two, why did you decide to become a therapist? Well, that, that could be loaded, right? Right. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So I, when I started, when I decided to go to college, I I was the first person in my family to ever go to college. And so Mm -hmm. I had no experience with what that would be like. And um, I have always had a love since I was probably five years old. I had a best friend who was from Mexico And she spoke Spanish. And I remember walking in and seeing her family watching TV in Spanish. And Uh I remember just thinking, wow, this is amazing. There's a whole nother language and a whole nother culture. And I just became intrigued. So from the time I was 10 years old, I started going to night school with my grandma to take Spanish classes. I don't know why that's a crazy thing for a kid to do, but, but I was totally in love um, Mm -hmm. with the language, the culture, the people. And, um, and I knew that I wanted to do something that had to do with people. So when I started college, I went to, uh, I started in international relations with a minor in Spanish. Mm. And after my first class, I had a big fat D and (laughs) I was not a D student. So that was not okay with me. And I realized this probably isn't where I want to be. Um, Mm -hmm. and I don't know why I just was drawn to the intro to social work class and took it. And from there, that's where my heart was. Absolutely. Um, to be able to, to work with others and, and uh, help our, one of our missions at Mountain View Family Therapy is to reduce unnecessary human suffering. Mm. And I think that's really the core of why, why I do this, because, you know, there are a lot of times we have to suffer in life and we can't really avoid it, Mm -hmm. but there are also a lot of times where we suffer maybe more than we have to, um, just because we don't have the support or we don't know how to make that suffering shorter in length or in intensity. Right. And so, so, um, so yeah, here I am. Oh, I love that story. Okay. So then from the time that you knew you wanted to be a social worker or therapist, how long did it take you to actually get licensed? What did that journey look like Ooh. In, a, in a nutshell, right? Yeah, so I, I'm definitely, I'm definitely an odd case in that. Mm-hmm. Um, when I obviously decided to be a therapist, I found out very quickly that you need a master's degree. So I knew I was going to be in school longer than the four years I had planned on. And, um, and when I was close to the, about, well, the end of my bachelor's degree, um, I met my husband and ended up getting married, which was not what I had thought would happen. Um, and decided to go to grad school and about three fourths of the way through grad school, we found out we were expecting our first child. Mm -hmm. Um, and we had planned it all. It was great. I would graduate in April and then she was due the end of June. And I thought, okay, this will be great. This will all work. Um, the tricky part came when a month before graduation, uh, my daughter was born almost four and a half months premature. Mm. So she was born at 25 weeks gestation. That is barely halfway one pound, 13 ounces. 
And we found ourselves in the hospital with this brand new tiny micro preemie. And I had about three more weeks to go in my graduate program. Um, so uh, somehow I finished it. I'm not sure how that's all a blur. Um, and she was in the hospital for about three months before she came home for the first time. And that started us on a path of lots of years of hospitalizations and surgeries. And so my plan of just graduating and then working my full-time job and getting my hours and becoming fully licensed was a little derailed. Mm -hmm. um, so it took me, it took me about 10 years to get my complete independent licensure. And I, I'm proud of that. That was a, that was hard one. Um, but I also needed, my family had a lot of needs at that time too. So I had to balance that. And, and that was one of the, that's one of the things I think is so awesome about the, the clinical professions and therapy is there's so much flexibility if you, if you, if you figure it out, or if you get some support around how to do that, um, it allowed me to be able to navigate, you know, having all these extenuating circumstances that I hadn't planned on, right? We all have extenuating circumstances all the time. So, so having that flexibility, it took me a long time to get to that space, but it worked for us and, and it allowed me to, to continue to do something I loved, but also navigate the very real things that were happening in my life. Right. And I, I feel like that's been a great guide for clinical work as a therapist, because we're teaching our clients all the time, you know, how do you navigate all these things that are happening in your life and still have fulfillment and still find peace and still find connection, right. In spite of all of that. So I feel like I got a crash course in my own personal life through that experience. I think that is the place that knowing that we can have a lot of derailments and still live out our purpose that like you had this clear idea of where you were going and slow and steady gets you there just the way that super fast gets you there. Right. And sometimes the lessons we learn along the way are really, really impactful on either space. And I think it's so inspiring to, to people who are listening to this, who might be thinking, oh my gosh, I've just been dreaming about this for a really long time. It's been years, you know, is this really plausible or possible? Maybe I should give up to say like, no, if you know, this is what you want to do. If this is like, what's in your heart and your soul and your being like, just keep going. Okay. So let's talk about private practice. When did you decide to start a private practice and how did you figure out those first steps? Because that moving, I think from like, Hey, I'm doing this. I've, I've got my hours. I've got my independent licensure to like, I'm a business owner is a pretty big transition. So tell me how you navigated that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I think I had one benefit. And that was that I had a family member who was really pushing me who kept saying, you know, you really should consider doing private practice. And my response would be, you have no idea how crazy that would be. What are you talking about? I, I don't even have a clue how to do that. I have no idea. Um, I, probably like most, most of your listeners never had even a seminar in my entire educational experience on a private practice, much yeah. less a class or directions or a handout, nothing. Right. So so that seemed extremely overwhelming. The possibility of even doing that seemed, it seemed impossible. Um, but it was always kind of in the back of my mind because of that voice saying, you know, what if you did this? What if you, you know, what if you, that would really give you a lot of flexibility. And again, with having a child who was born so early and then four more along the way, it, it was crazy. Life was crazy. Um, but, but when I finally made that decision, it really was the result of um, a few things. I think one was talking to other practice owners that was super important, getting information from the people who were doing it, um, finding out, I mean, it, it's that whole, you know, scenario that happens and plays out in our lives and the lives of our clients, right? When we start investigating and researching and checking into it, very rarely are things as big and scary as we think they are. Our anxiety creates this horrible worst case scenario, right? Yeah. And the truth is usually much more small and calm. So mm -hmm. as I, as I talked with other owners, you know, I was able to find out, okay, what are some of the things I need to do? I need to get a business license. I need to consider, you know, where do I want to do the work from? You know, do I want to see clients in person? Do I want to see them virtually? Do I, you know, do I need a space for that? Um, what are the licensure considerations? Do I want to take insurance versus private pra private pay? You know, those little basic things. And then, and then move from there. So it was really, okay, what are the, the first, you know, top three things that I need to know to do this? And once I got that information, it, it wasn't as insurmountable. 
Um, and so that was a starting place. I think it, it, it felt more doable and possible at that point. Awesome. And did you start with the vision of a group practice or did you start with the vision of a solo practice? Yeah, I definitely started with a solo practice. I thought, you know, you just, that's what a private practice is. It's you doing therapy directly with your clients without, you know, being organization and the agency kind of structure. Right. Um, but like, I think most clinicians will find when they start doing that work, um, there is not anyone that can, you can, that can replace you for you to call off. You know, we don't have a job like that. Um, uh, there's only one of you. And so there was only one of me. And so as I'm seeing clients, you know, word of mouth travels. And if a client has a good experience, they tend to tell people and then someone else comes in because they were referred and you start realizing that you're looking at your schedule. And the goal of this whole business was to simplify and make life more flexible and balanced. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden life can become something very different because people want to see you and we want to help. So I, well, I need to help then, right. I need to make a space for all of these people and the schedule starts looking really crazy. So, um, so after that happened for about a year, I realized I wasn't going to be able to provide the quantity of services mm -hmm. to the people who were seeking that I wanted to. And of course we can refer those out and you can continue. I mean, I could continue to do individual solo private practice. That wouldn't have been an issue, but I, I saw the need and um, people kept coming and realized I, I, I can't do this by myself. If I really want to be able to help more people, it's going to take more people to help more people. Yeah. I think that place of realizing the impact that you can have. And when, once you do create a sustainable business model, there's like, you were someone who people told you for years, you should do private practice. You should do private practice. And you're like, I don't really want to do that. And then at some point you shifted. There's a lot of therapists out there that never want to be business owners. Like never, ever, 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 ever. Like some of you are listening today. You never want to be a business owner, but sometimes the, you know, the organizations we're working for the nonprofits, the agencies, there's just such a culture of burnout. There's such a culture of um, really devaluing therapists' intuition and their training and creating these dynamics that don't provide the best services for clients. And so people are looking to have other experiences. They're trying to figure out, do I leave the profession because I'm burnt out and I'm starting to hate this amazing work and passion that I used to love? Or is there a way to find a place where I feel really valued and feel really connected and like I'm doing the work and, and I feel really strong about what I'm doing clinically. And I think that's where group practices um, really come in and meet a need for not just the community, but also within our profession um, and within the clinicians who really love this work and want to, you know, want to help. No, I, I agree with you hundred percent. I think it, it feels, it can feel a little help hopeless when we're in the agency model and it's so heavy. Um, and then we don't know that, you know, maybe private practice working in private practice, but not being the practice owner um, could actually be an option. Right. Um, and, and, and that we can provide a valuable, you know, contribution that way and continue to get engaged in the work we love, but without, the intensity of the ownership side. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, we definitely have a place for both and we need both. And yeah. I love, you know, as we've worked on moving to a group model, that's been something really important in my private private practice is that we, we kind of have, a, we operate from a hybrid model. So I like to call it, it's kind of the best of an agency feel in that we collaborate together. We meet, we join, we connect. Um, but we also have the flexibility and the independence of the private practice model without the disconnect. So yeah. It, it is, there are options, but if you don't know there are options, you know, it's, it seems like it's the all or nothing. You either have to be in an agency or you have to be a business owner and, and that, that can feel overwhelming. So knowing that there's an option besides that is, is important. Yeah. It's so powerful. I think there are so many burnout people right now, especially in the midst of the pandemic and all of the shifts and changes and the additional responsibilities. It's, and private practices are, are definitely getting more people than they can kind of handle. And so they're trying to figure out how to expand in a healthy way, but nonprofits and agencies are struggling as well. And so, you know, figuring out ways to really connect in and show up 
for our communities in a way that's really sustainable. But I think that's the piece. I think there's there really are a lot of people sitting in agencies that don't even know that there's an option because they're just they're just doing the work, doing the best that they can. They go home, they scroll maybe through Facebook or Instagram, or they play some game on their phone, and then they go and do it again. And they're just kind of like um, surviving. They're in survival mode as opposed to going, wait, what what do I really need? What do I really need? Okay, so let's talk about as you move from solo to group practice, what were the biggest lessons that you learned? What were the things that you were not expecting that kind of um, maybe you could help other people listening to plan for and expect? Yeah, there it is really kind of one of those things that uh, it's a little bit hard to, to get a solid understanding or know what to expect um, until you're in the middle of it. Um, and so again, I can't express enough, you know, the importance of connecting with other people who've done it because that really can save a lot of headache. Um, you know, I guess one of the biggest surprises for me, um, and it still is three and a half years later, I'm still shocked by the amount of investment that other people can have in your business, right? Other -hmm. people who are not, they're not, they're not the owner of the practice. Mm -hmm. They're, they're working at the practice, but they become committed and engaged and they Mm -hmm. take ownership for, for the success of what's happening at, at, at our, at our practice. And, um, it, it still, it does take my breath away a little bit. It's such an honor to be able to, um, feel that from other people. Um, you know, we, I, I believe that we live in a world where most people have good intentions right? We get mixed up and bogged down with all the craziness once in a while. But, but I I have to believe that we, we we're surrounded by people who, who want us to succeed. And, and, um, and, and I think group private practice, that's one of the biggest pleasant surprises for me has been to see how our team comes together, because we want everyone to succeed in our team, including our clients who are part of our team as well, right? Our community partners, um, our other practice owners who are in the area who want to be successful and maybe collaborate with us or ask for some support. Um, it's just awesome uh, that when you think that, at least for me, when I thought about going into private practice and one of the reasons why I was so resistant and hesitant was the thought of, I'm going to be in this alone. Mm-hmm. It's going to be so lonely to be in private practice. And when we're in solo private practice, sometimes I think it can be if we don't really make a conscious effort to connect with other business owners and like-minded people. Yeah. But the cool thing about group practice is you don't have to be in it alone at all. And when it's, you know, in that group setting, you really can create a culture and an environment where it, it really is kind of the best of the agency world mm-hmm. with the best of the private practice world. And I think that's the, the, the key is the creating the culture. Um, I'm sure you're in group practice um, groups. I'm in group practice groups. I've worked with a lot of group practice owners. There are definitely group practice owners that come to, to work with us at ZinniMe who are not saying, wow, I feel like our whole team is there and everyone's committed to success. That is not always the scenario. What are some of the things that you feel like you implemented that really set the foundation for that culture of like, hey, we're all in this together. And that also attracted the people that resonated with that culture in particular. Yeah, those are those are super important pieces. I think um, I'm going to start with the second one, the, the attracting people first, because I think that is one of the key pieces, right? Is who do you bring in as a part of your team that really has every impact on the culture? And, and, and the day-to-day feel of what's happening, right? So, so um, at first, when you transition from individual to group, um, there can be this real sense of overwhelm of, okay, now what do I do and who do I get? And I need to grab whoever's there first. So that whoever's at the door, they, I need to take them. No, don't do it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> right? But there's this desperation, right? Of how am I going to make this individual to group transition work? And the only way I'm going to make that work is with bodies, with people. Mm. So I need to just grab, and especially right now, I think the environment, like you mentioned before with the pandemic and all of the struggles and, and challenges that has brought up, um, there's a lot of issues with hiring. We're seeing it across the world in every industry, not just yeah. ours, right? Yeah. But ours is certainly impacted. So this desperation can creep in of, I just got to grab whoever's there. And um, I, I think that's a perfect time to take a moment to breathe, to center, to step back and, and really assess 
Um, what, what do I want in my team? And does this person match that? So if you don't know what it is you want, you got to start there and then use that assessment process for every single person. I mean, sometimes for us, it's even, it's even linked into who our internet provider is, who our phone service is, because when they're coming in and they're working with, they're in our office, um, the, the energy they bring impacts what we do. So yeah. who are our community partners? Who are our, it goes everywhere, but it really starts with that core team of who, who, who's a part of this team. Yeah. What do I want to create? So really um, being particular there, even when it's hard and it's scary, because maybe we only, we're trying to hire a new therapist, for example, and we have one applicant and that's all we have. And so this, this, I got to just grab that one person really on the front end, making sure that that's the right fit for you is a key piece. And, and believe me, I know it's horrifying and scary to not grab them while they're there, but if they're not right for you, they're not that's right. going to have a fallout. Yeah. It's yeah. going to have a and huge it's gonna, fallout. It's going to cost you more, more time, energy, money, and heartache in the, in the long run. And I think this, uh, this applies to not just group practice and hiring. This also applies to what I see happening even with who people are taking on as, as clients, this like, not even desperation, but the sense of, so we have desperation on sometimes the hiring and like, oh my gosh, I've got a ton of expenses. I bet you were surprised at the amount of expenses in a group practice versus solo practice and how quickly you can say like, oh my gosh, we're, we're making half a million dollars. Wait, my profits are like, abysmal or like maybe they're less than when I was doing one-to-one or, you know, million dollar practice. Oh, wait, now I'm just barely getting to where I was when I was solo, you know, all of these different pieces. So there can be desperation in terms of hiring, but I think also in terms of taking on clients, there can be a sense of obligation, meaning um, even past the point of like the desperation of like, I don't know how to market and I don't know if enough people are going to calling, calling me. I feel like there's a lot of therapists feeling obligation right now. And so they're saying yes to clients where their intuition is saying, I don't, I don't think that I'm the best person for them. I don't, I, I think someone else would actually be better, but I don't have the words. I haven't been taught how to set those boundaries and how to really lovingly point this person in the right direction. And so I'm going to stuff down my intuition, which is also linked to our clinical judgment, Right. That intuition is part of the clinical judgment. We shove it down and we ignore it. And then suddenly we're sitting going, oh, hey, there, clinical judgment that I ignored and said, you don't count because um, my, my frontal lobes hadn't caught up. Um, I think sometimes that's a piece that, especially the longer that we've been in practice, the more training that we, that we have, if we are if we're really listening, sometimes that intuition will assess the situation much more quickly than we can. Right. And yes, we have to be watching for bias and we have to be watching for those other things. But if we're doing our own work, we can feel the difference between when we're being biased versus when we're just, oh no, my gut, my gut says it. So I think that place of the intentionality, and I know like we have this happen all the time in boot camp. People get full and they're like, I think group practice is the next thing. So my first thing is hiring. We're like, no, go back to the beginning. You need to sit down and really get clear on what is your vision? What do you, what is your group practice going to look like? What is that going to do? Now let's look at the actual like modeling of the finances. What are the additional expenses you're going to have? What's the bigger vision? Do you want to be able to create um, benefits for people. Well, we need to plan for that from the beginning, because if you set a, a fee and a pay scale that doesn't give you enough profits to offer benefits, but that's your, uh, your long-term goal. Well, then you can't walk it back and say, I'm going to cut your pay, but I'm going to give you benefits. That doesn't feel good. Right? So what, what do we do to really look at that and get that big picture perspective and really create a business plan for something that has a lot of moving parts, right? Anyways, I love that. Off. Yeah, I'm no, off I, my I think, soapbox. <laughs> no, I think you're absolutely. I mean, that whole mission, vision, values kind of process is so mm -hmm. key up front. And it's, it does seem like it maybe is a little more simple when we're solo um, because there's so many other moving pieces. And, 
And yeah, looking at, do you want to offer benefits? What kind of schedule opportunities do you want to offer? What kind of, um, I love your, you know, the words that you used of that desperation and the obligation. Um, I know we have a, we probably, we have almost a hundred people on our wait list right now. Mm -hmm. And, and I have to, every time we have a staff meeting, I have to remind my staff, it's not your job to see every person that has a need. We can't do it. It's yeah. impossible. We, we, we didn't offer a wait list forever. Um, mm -hmm. But then we just, we, we processed it. We talked about it as a team and we came to that decision. Okay. We're going to just go ahead and do it, but we're real clear with our people on our wait list. You know, we, we, we hope to have a space open for you. We think it'll be this about this range of time, but we can't guarantee that. And meanwhile, mm -hmm. here are some other resources. And if you really are set that you want to come here, then mm -hmm. we'll look at that. But our clinicians can only do what their schedule allows. And I'm, t you know, we have to yeah. say things like, no, you don't get to add five more slots to your week because yeah. we have a wait list. That's not how it works. We can't mm -hmm. do it that way. It's backwards mm -hmm. and it will burn us all out. And then mm -hmm. we will see zero clients. We yes. will help zero people because we won't be available to do yes. it. So, yes. so that's a key. Yeah, that's a huge part of our culture and, and setting that up because I'm uh, traditionally <laughs> business people are not known for their wonderful boundaries. Yeah. We push ourselves to the brink constantly. Yeah. So that's where it had to start for me. It was stepping back and going, okay, wait a minute, Tracy, what can you do? And what can you not do? And we got to yeah. be honest about this, because if I'm setting that example for my team that you push until you cannot, you're dragging yourself across the ground, bleeding yeah. from every inch, <laughs> that that's what, that's what being successful means. No, it's not. And as a therapist, especially we cannot do that. And when, when our, when my daughter has to have a surgery that I didn't plan for, cause you don't plan for surgeries or when whatever it is, it can be a yeah. huge thing. It can be a little thing. We have to have space for that. Yeah. And we have to model that in a healthy way to our staff, to our team, that we really practice what we preach, that we really yeah. are going to try to live that way because we want them to live that way too. And that it matters. And it matters so much that I actually am doing it. Yes. And it's hard. It's hard to do that. It's really hard. And I will, I will also, I'm going to share with all of you listening and also with you, one of the recommendations that we're making right now, um, because there are a lot of people trying to figure out the wait list versus not wait list. Um, and what we're recommending is instead of offering a wait list offering, Hey, here's our newsletter. And this is where we advertise when we do have appointments and it does a couple of things. It allows you to um, not go through this weird administration thing where you finally have an opening and then you're calling each person and you're like, well, do I leave them for four hours? Do I wait for a day? Do I wait for three days? Like, what does this really look like? You know, is this fair or is this not fair? Um, and so sometimes you can end up with slots even going unused just because you're spending so much time going down the wait list. Um, it's not, a, again, there's no perfect system. Let's be really clear sure. about that. There's no perfect system. Um, but saying, you know, Hey, we really want you to go and see someone else. Like we really want you to be seen, but we know it's really hard right now. Here's what happens when we do have openings. This is the first place that we go. The first come first say of basis, people can schedule a consultation and get in. And then, and that's where we know, and you can even be specific of saying, we have a Thursday at 3 PM that's open for someone who specializes in ABC. <laughs> if that sounds like you, you know, we know that there's several hundred of you on this list. If, you know, if you fit this, this space, um, click and, and go forward. And that has been really impactful. And I think it also gives some flexibility for practice owners, um, for launching group therapy, for launching other aspects of how can we kind of meet the need and demand um, there. And I have some group practice owners, again, who they have this set up. So it's very easy when they go from I'm taking clients to I'm full, they can easily kind of switch that out even on their website. So then it helps people not have to waste their time and energy, but they can still kind of get in on this on the um, in the space. So hope yeah, that's helpful that. <laughs> to you I, I or to it, someone else that's listening. I think that's, you know, anytime we can find a system that's going to automate kind of a process and cut down the, the amount of effort and work and disappointment for our clients, potential, you know, disappointment for them, disappointment for us, because you're, like you said, we're trying to, we're calling 20 people and the first five, 
you know, they maybe don't get back to us and we're waiting and we're holding spots and then, yeah, it makes a lot of craziness. So yeah. I think that's super valuable. <laughs> Anytime we can just kind of make it so that it kind of resolves itself and yes. let people reach out when they're ready. That's great. Yeah. I think it's great. Okay. Awesome. Blossom. So what would be, as we're kind of wrapping up, this has been so fantastic. I know you kind of described a little bit about the size of your practice. I think we talked about that on here, 20, 20 people on your team or what have you, um, for other people that have the vision of having like a big team and a balanced life, what would be your number one piece of advice, um, to them? Like, here's (laughs) maybe it's the, here's what I wish I did, or like, here's what I did. And like, it made all the difference. What would be your biggest piece of advice? Boy, I, you know, that hindsight, you can always look back and go, man, I should have done that, should have done this. But I I would say that one thing that has made the biggest impact and has made the process more simple for me, um, a process that tends to be complex, there are lots of pieces, right? We've talked about that, Mm -hmm. um, is get some support before you think you need it. And specifically around your roles in your office. So for me, Mm -hmm. we started with an admin person from the beginning. And I think it was one of the best things I ever did. It's mm-hmm. scary um, because we often look at it as an extra expense. And where is the, you know, where, where is the, the fund, where are the funds for that coming from? And how am I going to navigate that? But again, when we're talking about culture, we're talking about structure, we're talking about um, predictability, safety systems, um, just longevity, um, having Uh, someone on my admin team from the beginning that could help with things like scheduling, which becomes ultimately more complex when you have multiple clinicians uh, and schedules and times and rooms, Um, having someone who navigated scheduling, having someone that was helping with uh, verifying insurance and benefits, Mm -hmm. who was navigating um, if there was a billing issue or a question from clients, you have way more questions when you have way more clients. (laughs) Having someone to navigate that and someone who was representing, was the face of our agency from the beginning, provided a level of professionalism, a level of uh, put togetherness that didn't even exist at that time, but it appeared that it did because we had someone there in that role. It, it was it was infinitely valuable for us in, in setting the stage for us to be able to grow. It gave me somewhere to delegate because there are so many things that as a practice owner, If you really want to find that balance, you've got to get some support with it. You've got to have somebody else helping. We can't do all of it, even though we try until our last breath. Like I said, we're hanging off the cliff and (laughs) we're still saying, but I can do one more thing. Um, Having somebody and and by default, somebody that was great that said, hey, Tracy, you seem like you're a little stressed out today. What can I take off your plate that even initiated some of that was such a huge learning experience for me and really helped me learn as a leader a pattern that was going to have to be continually built upon um, to, to allow other people to help because that's what being in a group private practice is all about. It's about not doing it all by yourself. Yeah. That's why you get other people to come in. Yeah. So, so having uh, maybe sooner than you think, having uh, building up that support team, whatever it looks like, whether it's a great coach, whether you're reaching mm-hmm. out for some services and learning how to grow your private practice, whether you're being coming part of a Facebook group private practice kind of setting Or, um, you know, building that kind of piece of it, for me, a big key part of that was actually, like I said, having an admin from the very beginning, because I knew I wanted our clients to have face to face interaction, phone someone, a live person answering, those kinds of things were important in our value structure. And it made a huge difference and still continues now three and a half years later, where we are, you know, approaching $2 million and have 20 clinicians and have 300 sessions a week. And it's just, it just keeps growing and breaking ground on our own building this month, which I can't even believe. Um, Things that I never imagined when I started out on this journey, um, started really with that decision of, What's my core support system from the very beginning? What do I want that to look like? And I, and I think that like doing the numbers around that, right. Setting your fee with the expectation of I need support. So we set our fee often with the idea of, oh, I need an office or I want this nice couch, or I want to make sure that like, it's that my office is in a, in a safe location with parking, but we don't think about, well, I also need to set my fee so that there's support. (laughs) Like, what does that really look like? 
Um, so I, oh my gosh, I love everything about this. And I think it is so inspiring. I feel like we could talk like for a whole nother thing about the whole, like buying a building and all of that, but, um, maybe we'll do a follow-up at some point, um, as the building gets a little farther, farther along or what have you. Okay. <sighs> oh my gosh. Thank you again, Tracy. I so appreciate you sharing your journey. Um, for those of you who are listening, if you need support, you need co- um, community, know that we have free resources for you. We have over 10 hours of free training on all aspects of uh, launching your private practice, whether it's solo or group. And we have a vibrant um, free community with over 15,000 members um, right now. And it's not on Facebook. So there's no ads, there's no drama, and we have a great community around you. So if you want to check that out, go to zinnime.com. And um, if you want to check out Tracy um, over in the uh, over in Utah, go ahead and uh, check out the show notes and uh, we'll get you, we'll have all of her information out there. Thank you again, Tracy. Thanks so much for having me.